Hello everyone, this is Chris back again with The Ancient Scholar. This is video two in a uh, series of videos on liberation from mechanical ventilation. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so I'll pick up where I left off on our discussion earlier. And I'm going to pick up on, uh, pick, up, uh, pick it up on uh, talking about predictor, uh, predictors of weaning outcome. Uh, some of the other assessments that we want to do. Um, so now we want to look at the ventilatory muscle capacity. And these are, of course, um, uh, some of the PFTs. Uh, assessing the vital capacity. And I want a vital capacity of greater than 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight, or at least, at least a liter for an adult patient. If their vital capacity is less than 15 milliliters per kilogram or less than a liter, that is a very concerning um, sign. I uh, also want to assess their maximum inspiratory pressure, the MIP, or the NIF, the negative inspiratory force, uh, or NIP, negative inspiratory pressure. They all mean the same thing. Um, really what I'm looking for is at least a, a greater than negative 20 to negative 30 centimeters of water. Now, the normal MIP is about negative 50 to negative 100. Okay, so negative 20 to negative 30 is not normal. It's just something that we look at, at, at as far as getting a patient liberated. But we, if somebody's right at 20, for example, uh, we, need to, we need to assess very closely this patient because, again, 20 is still exceptionally low. It's just um, uh, kind of an arbitrary um, cutoff that people look at um, for predicting um, failure, ultimately failure uh, to um, uh, liberate. Uh, look at ventilatory performance, uh, minute ventilation, the um, MVV is something you can look at, the maximum voluntary ventilation. You want that to, 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 to be at least three times the minute ventilation. Um, the RSBI, I'll talk about this in a little more detail. This is the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. Really important here. This tells us a lot of information. Um, some sources uh, say that it is, is one of the definitive indicators of, of predicting a successful liberation. And we'll talk about what the rapid shallow breathing index is here in a little bit. Um, and actually, I'll just talk about it now. Or you know what? I'll, I'll talk about it here in a little bit. Uh, the respiratory rate, again, we want that less than 30, if at all possible. Um, okay, the, the, um, let's talk about the MIP in a little more detail, the uh, maximum respiratory pressure. Um, the thing we need to know about this is, is there's an excellent predictive value. Um, as far as predicting who's going to fail. And, and there are a couple studies where um, if the value was negative 20 and greater, so negative 20, negative 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 4, you know, so on and so forth, um, there is, there, I think it was a small study, it showed about 100%, almost 100% of the patients that had um, a, an MIP that was very, uh, that was, this was very non reassuring, um, almost all of them. Uh, virtually all of them failed to to be weaned or liberated. Um, however, so the MIP is very good at, at identifying patients that are not going to fly. However, it is not good at identifying patients who will do well. So let's say somebody has a great MIP. Let's say that they have a negative 50. That doesn't necessarily mean that that patient's going to do well. But if that same patient were to have a negative 18, um, that is a very good indicator that that patient is not going to do well. So that's the importance of the MIP or the, the NIF. So it's good at identifying patients who will likely fail, but it's not good at identifying patients who can be successfully um, liberated. Uh, the RSBI, the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, it's Index of Rapid and Shallow Breathing, and what it is is it's a respiratory rate, the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume, and um, I'll just put it up here real quick with all the other um, stuff we have here. So it's the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume. And the rate is in, in breaths per minute. So let's say 10 breaths per minute. And the tidal volume, we need to convert to liters. We do not use uh, milliliters. So let's say their tidal volume is 500 milliliters. That would be 0 0.5. And then I divide 0 0.5 into 10, and um, I I get my number. <clears throat> so we can just kind of go ahead and do that if 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 you guys want. Just a fairly easy calculation. So five goes into 10. Two times. 
and then of course we have a point there, so that's 20. So, that's the um, RSBI. Um, what we're looking at for a RSBI, um, it, it, you're looking at um, 105 or less. So, a um, small RSBI is a really good thing. Anything um, greater than uh, 105, and uh, we're really going to be concerned um, about it, 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 the ability to effectively wean a patient. In fact, um, there have been some studies that say, say that if the RSBI is greater than 105, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we in fact uh, can have up to a 95% um, uh, rate of, of um, unsuccessful weaning. Um, so it's actually, again, considered one of the most predictive uh, bedside parameters to, to assess a monitor and patient um, for the effectiveness and ability to wean. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and talk about approaches to weaning. And there are really four primary approaches that we can look at. And there's some other uh, newer ones uh, like vo uh, volume support and some of these, these other uh, the newer things. I'll talk about the traditional or the classical ways. And uh, the first is spontaneous breathing trial, or SBT. Uh, the second is pressure support ventilation, followed by SIMV and something called a T-piece trial. And um, even though I'm, I'm, I'm labeling these as separate approaches, often what we find is that um, many providers will use a combination of approaches. Uh, so don't think that these uh, occur by themselves in a vacuum, but I will talk about them individually. Okay, so a spontaneous breathing trial, and this is this is something that I, I believe uh, it's my bias that, that is very important, and I believe that um, in most patients, most patients should have a spontaneous breathing trial done every single day, every single day. Do a trial, even if they don't do well. We need to do the trial to see see how that patient is doing and actually trend, actually trend the results of that trial and document it. Um, basically what it is, is it involves uh, placing the patient into a spontaneous mode of breathing or ventilation and seeing how they do. You can, it can be accomplished in CPAP, it can be accomplished in a bi-level. Bi um, certain ventilators can in, do, do bi-level ventilation, uh, not, not the, the, um, the invasive bi-level um, like the, the APRV and all that, but but more like um, what you're familiar with the, the, the term BiPAP, that kind of bi-level where I provide two, two pressures, uh, pressure high, pressure low, uh, to a spontaneously breathing patient. Um, uh, I can do CPAP. Uh, I can do CPAP with pressure support. Um, and I can even do T-piece, uh, which uh, I'll talk about my bias about T-piece here in a little bit. But... What, what, what needs to happen is, we, if at all possible, put the patient into a spontaneous mode and see how they do. How long do we do this? Well, some people say you should go for a full two hours. Some people say for 30 minutes. Uh, there, there are some studies out there that show absolutely no difference in, in success between 30 minutes and two hours. So it's going to be a clinical judgment call and uh, probably um, protocol-based if you're a therapist. Um, so what do we do? Well, we, we, uh, we put the patient in spontaneous mode. We um, often will have to uh, uh, decrease our, our sedation. Um, and we, also, we always need to be very careful about sedating patients in the ICU. I, I know the nurses are really aggressive, aggressively trained about uh, pain control, analgesia, and sedation. But the problem is this becomes uh, somewhat analogous to a dog chasing its tail in that um, when I give lots of sedatives and lots of analgesics, and, and they very well may be warranted in some cases, I'm not saying that, they're not, but when, we, when, we, when we're when very aggressive about this, what do sedatives and analgesics do? Well, they depress the respiratory drive. So it, we often need to consider decreasing some of the sedation and allowing the patient to wake up and, and, and seeing what the patient can do. I mean, if we have a patient who's sedated to the point of, of not being able be able to interact with the ventilator at all, then how we ever how do we ever have any hope of getting them off the ventilator? So, you know, some people will call a sedation vacation. You know, we'll, in the morning we'll we'll decrease the sedation, let the patient wake up, um, put them in a spontaneous breathing trial, and and, and see how they do.